uh, my idea now is, um, man, despite the fact that I spent the last hour and a half or whatever teaching you about all the tools that existed in the past, uh, many of which I wrote, I'm now going to switch over to our new stuff. Um, and so we're going to walk through what's called the Nearest Toolbox, the really creative name for our new methods. Um, please, this is needs to go back and forth, so if you guys have questions or something's not clear, please, please ask. And the goal here is to kind of walk you through uh, some of the methods that, how we do this in, uh, in my toolbox and, and stuff. And let me explain a little bit of the background of this. Um, it's, it's kind of odd when people come up to me and I say, they talk about Homer and how I use Homer, I'm like, yeah, I, I don't. Um, the, the Homer was written in, uh, starting in about 2002, uh, by me and David Boas as a means to analyze the data that we were collecting with our instruments. We were physicists. The most ex exciting thing that we did about the brain is if you tap your finger, something happens over here. Um, and we were kind of interested in hardware development, developing mirrors. We weren't necessarily asking the kind of questions that psychologists or you know, the hypothesis and so we wrote Homer basically for our purposes. We were testing out new methods and, and stuff like that. Um, at some point, we realized that this was kind of a useful thing that uh, people wanted. So we ended up making it open source and giving it, putting it up on the web. Um, but 15 years later, or whatever, now as as a, as a professor, and I work with a lot of different groups in psychiatry and stuff, the questions that were being asked. You know, people would come to me and it's like, great, we collected the data. Can you show me an image of, you know, condition A versus condition B, covariate for age and gender treating um, visit as a random effect or something? Something, you know, something like that. I'd be like, uh, no, because Homer can't do that. And I realized that the methods that people really wanted were not the way that we had coded up Homer. And in fact, actually, to even answer that question properly, to do to make that image that my co-investigators wanted, really meant, I, I'm sorry, Thomas, I started without you. Um, really went going back to almost square one, because the, the in order to answer that question, I had to propagate all the information, all the noise, all the uncertainty through the model, since I had enough information at the end uh, to properly address that, that question. And just the tools in Homer were not designed with that in mind. They were designed, they just kind of evolved over time, but from a base of a bunch of physicists sitting around tapping their fingers. And so uh, my student, uh, Jeff Barker, um, who I unfortunately was unable to keep in academia, he was an awesome programmer uh, and, and, and great, absolutely great student. Um, my other PhD student dragged him away uh, to, to industry. Um, so, so they're, they're making iPhone apps with a startup. But um, Jeff uh, originally wrote the nearest toolbox that I'm going to uh, kind of show with kind of that idea in mind of knowing the end result, knowing I want to address this hypothesis, how do we propagate it, all the information we need to that end so that we can, we can, we can do this for our collaborators. And so that's kind of the, the framework. Um, the nearest toolbox is... Uh, first and foremost, focused on getting the stats right. Uh, so it actually doesn't have a lot of those methods that I described early on of filtering and processing your data and pre-processing, because it turns out that those are not actually truly essential to get the stats right. Um, and actually, if you get the stats right, a lot of those methods aren't even needed anymore. Um, uh, with, that, with that said, uh, they do help because having noise in your data is a, is a bad thing. If you had less noise, you'd have better data. But if your stats are dealt with correctly, then you don't, and you're able to uh, avoid false discovery and avoid uh, uh, kind of those issues, your results are still correct. They'd be maybe better if you had less noise, but you're, you're not gonna publish results that are false. And so that was kind of the goal of the nearest toolbox was to get the stats right. So the nearest toolbox is, uh, it's MATLAB written, uh, it's open source, it's available on a site called Bitbucket. I, I do have all this kind of in uh, PowerPoint, with, so don't try to jot down those really tiny words at the, the top. And I think Thomas might have actually sent that link 
But if you go to the, this Bitbucket site, you can find the nearest toolbox um, here. Um, there's a, if you, the opening page is a wiki uh, that I in, embarrassingly haven't updated in quite a while. But if you go to like download and installation, if my computer actually works, uh, it'll bring you, oh, sure. Um, how do I do this? Okay, apparently I can't visit this on the URI network. But anyway, go to download and installation. It does have instructions for how to download um, this. And I'll, I'll walk that through in a second. If you go through some of this, like demos and examples, I've pasted some of the uh, demos that I'm going through on this website that you can actually work through. And it has a bit of information about uh, the data structures and stuff. It's actually the exact same data structure that, <clears throat> that Homer uses. So uh, if, if, and if you want to just download it quickly, you can go to this page. That's probably not going to work either. But this page here that says download, and you just say download toolbox, and it checks, it downloads the, the latest version. Yeah, it's not going to work. Um, but if, if you go to that, on that wiki page with the downloads, it has a little bit more detailed instructions. Because the advantage of, of Bitbucket is kind of like GitHub or some of these other sites, is it lets me continually make changes to my code. And so if you want the latest, greatest version, because as I'm working through the example today, I found a mistake that I fixed right here in front of you. I can push those changes to the, to the internet and you can check out the latest version on your computer. And so it has this, and if you don't like those changes, you can actually roll back to the version from February 2016 or whatever to keep a nice stable version for, for your study. Uh, so Bitbucket uses a program called Mercurio. Mercurio is a way to manage those, uh, those things, but if you download, you go to that, that you know, instruction page, it'll direct you to this program to, called Cordus HG, and this is a nice program that installs on uh, Windows or a Mac computer where you just right-click on the folder and say update, and it automatically updates with the latest version. Uh, so it's, it's a nice way to make sure you have the latest version of this. Um, with Bitbucket, there's also, um, uh, there's a way if you go to the website, you can, uh, it's not going to work again, but you can, you can, issue, you can uh, file issues. Like, hey, Ted, your program is just terrible. Please fix it. Um, you can submit that, and I get an email of you know with these requests and, and stuff like that, and, and I can respond back with the website. So if you do identify a bug or, or something like that, sending it through the website um, is, is actually really nice. And I, I have a postdoc that fixes it all the time. Um, in fact, actually, we're going to do this. Of, this is the Tortoise HG, and if you open it up uh, on a Mac, you open it up like here. And you can just say update, and apparently I don't have internet access anymore. But what it would do is update the latest version. It would tell me any changes. It also keeps a history, so it shows you that last night I fixed the load function for the new Nerex format and added a stimulus GUI, which is what I needed to do for the demo today. So, and actually this morning at 10 a.m., I know my postdoc updated something with Granger causality. So, um, but I haven't looked at it yet. Anyway, the, the toolbox is uh, MATLAB-based. It does, um, unfortunately, require a fairly new version of MATLAB 2014 or above. Uh, I say unfortunate because Homer requires 2013 or below. So, if you want to do both Homer and my code, unfortunately, you do two versions of MATLAB. Um, I will try to fix that. 2014... Um, MATLAB re offered a release that introduced a bunch of new features that didn't previously exist, and my toolbox so heavily relies on that that I can't, it, it won't work on the old version. Uh, that also tells you that I've written this entire thing since late 2014, and there's something like 200,000 lines of code in there. Um, so, anyway, this, let's go to this. So, the way the toolbox works is... Um, let's see if I can find data. So it's, it's, it's MATLAB based, and let's just go to the folder. And there's toolbox. So inside of this, uh, this folder, so this, the nearest toolbox is this folder, 
uh, it contains a subfolder called demos. So if you go into demos, there is a bunch of uh, demos, MATLAB scripts, that are fully functional uh, that will show different, demonstrate different features about the toolbox. I'm going to work through kind of uh, some stuff with uh, the Nerex data that we just collected yesterday. Not the data we collected yesterday, but that Thomas gave me related to the data we collected yesterday. It was a little bit earlier. Um, but these... Yeah, so, uh, uh, this is the data that I sent out last night. Oh, okay. Okay. You want to follow along? Uh, you, you can. You can. You can try. Um, I'll. I'll go through. I'm going to go through s s like the the, the Nerex data first, kind of like and kind of walk you through that. Um, but these these demos you can look on at your uh, leisure. Um, they're really actually. I can open up one. They're they're. Uh, um, they're really extensively documented. Um, so like this one, Mirror's Analysis Demo, if I just hit run, it'll just run through the whole thing. But it actually starts off, it downloads data from Bitbucket. So it, 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 if you don't have the data on your computer, it'll actually download it automatically. And then it walks through um, um, loading up the data, doing basic analysis, converting it to hemoglobin, doing stats on it and stuff. I'll, I'll talk to you, uh, I'll show you. Uh, in a second. Um, the way that the data uh, works is, or the load works, is the toolbox is able to handle uh, demographic information as well. So when we get to the level of group, group level stats and you have a study with young and old subjects and maybe multiple visits per subject, you can actually, um, when you run your ANOVA testing and stuff, you can actually use those as covariance. Um, uh, in, in the toolbox. And this is all set up when you first load the data um, that you have, let's say, my study folder and inside of my study folder you can have group one and group two or old and young and whatever. And then inside of group one maybe I have two subjects, A and B, uh, as subfolders and then inside of those folders are all your NERX data um, or your .NERX files or whatever. And so you can specify this hierarchy of folder structures. And then when you load the data, you can say, well, the first level denoted the group, the second level denoted the subject. Or the first level was group, the second level was the subject, the third level was a session. Um, and so by creating this hierarchical folder, all I do is I point to this, you know, where's the root folder, the, the, where's the data live, and tell it how to interpret the folders, and it'll automatically load and populate all that, that stuff. Um, I'll show you, it, I won't show you here, but in the example, there's ways to then uh, load that up from Excel or SPSS as well. So you can add even more information uh, that you can then use in your analysis. Um, return to this. Okay. So. So. Let me, uh, yeah, so you can upload additional demographics um, from an Excel file or a or CSV or, you know, actually load dot .save files from, from SPSS. Uh, don't tell the SPSS people, but I hacked their data format because it, it, it technically is proprietary. Um, yeah, um, but it, it directly reads dot .save files. Yeah, don't, don't put that on YouTube. Um, <laughs> oh, I totally, I, I totally forgot that this was being YouTubed. Um, yeah, okay, well, we'll edit that, that one out. Okay, so, so, so I have some data, um, the data that you guys uh, also had that Thomas sent the link to, and it's in, right now I have it in this folder called Nerex Demo. Uh, I have one subject, oh, sorry, let's, let's clear this so we can move it up. So I have, I have in that in that Nerex demo folder, I've created a folder for subject one. And if we look inside subject one, um, that's the the file that that uh, Thomas sent. So this is scan number two from this subject. If I had another scan, I'd have another scan folder. And inside of these is your typical Nerex uh, structures. Okay. So each it, for Nerex data, each scan. 
uh, goes into a separate folder. Uh, you know, when the NARIC system collects, it creates a new folder, scan2, and dumps all the data in there. With some of the other systems, RNIST, the Tekken systems, you're going to have just a single file. So you might have a folder with all five scans in that file. But same thing, same thing is true. I just have, I have a subject, and inside of that subject, I have, I have all my scans. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to load up that data real quick. Um, and so I told it, I, 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 the commands all look something like this. So the nearest toolbox um, for the computer program that's in the room, it defines what's called a namespace. Uh, but it basically all the commands are something like nears.io for input output dot load directory or nears.io dot load nearx or nears dot math dot do something interesting. Okay, and, and so, so I call the command load directory and telling it this Rhode Island folder that contains my data. Um, I'm still busy because I meant to, I forgot that I change the folder name. Sorry. Let me do that again. Okay. I had lots of data in that folder, so it was actually trying to load more than just, just that. Um, but, uh, so, so I told it, load the directory, I told it which folder, and I told it you're gonna encounter this hierarchy key hierarchy of folders denoting subject. Now it's only going to get one subject out of here. Um, why is it still? This is embarrassing. My computer's being slow. Fortunately, I already loaded the data this morning, so we're going to just stop there. I think that's I'll pretend like that didn't happen. Okay, it does work. I swear, my computer's just doing uh, a lot of stuff right now. Anyway, so we loaded up the data um, via that raw that load data load directory function. If I had lots of subjects or something, it might take a little bit of time to load. Um, it's actually loading. Um, you kind of saw it a little bit when it, it, it loaded. It said it was loading the head mesh, which is this 3D registration uh, from the NERAX. It only does it for the first subject and then just copies it all for the, all the other subjects. But there's a way, if you, for some reason, did have a different montage for every subject, it will load it that way. Most of the time spent loading is loading that montage. So I only really want to do it once unless I have to. Um, but what gets loaded is a this data variable, I called it raw, and it's actually a structure containing the information about where the data came from, so description, the actual data itself, which is 1,800 time points by 40 channels, the probe, which describes where those 40 channels came from, and I'll show that in a second, um, information about the stimulus timing, information about demographics, and the sample rate. And this is actually uh, what's, what's called a, um, a MATLAB object or class, uh, class definition. And it's, it's actually, what's, what's nice about this is that raw, the object, knows how to draw itself. So, so, so I, I have these what are called methods, and the, the methods will, um, come on, please work. My computer is slow. Okay, there. So I drew a channel one from raw, and you see that's, that's the, the, the data as a time course, and you see the stimulus information put on. So, so these, these objects uh, have methods that I can, I can call like draw, and depending on what the object is, whether it's raw data or hemoglobin or a stats variable, when I say draw, it automatically knows what that means. And so it's a uh, what's called context-specific function. It knows that if I'm a, a stats object and you said draw, do it this way. If I'm a raw data cor time course like this, do it this other way. Yeah, yeah. I'll show you that we're getting where this is. This is just the the, the start of this, um, and I realize I only have 20 minutes, um, but we'll keep going. Okay. 
so 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 there is so 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 we do have a number of um, well. So, so let me take a step back. So right now there's only one data file. I only loaded one. If I had multiple subjects, or whatever, this would actually be uh, what's called an array. It would have multiple entries. So I would say raw one dot draw or raw two dot draw. If I said raw dot draw and I had ten subjects, it would actually draw all ten images like like that. Um, we have a number of tools in here, and again, all of this is in the, so don't jot down too many notes because it's all in the demos. Um, but there is a number of um, graphical interfaces that really, sorry. Um, sorry, that's embarrassing. That's really embarrassing. This is because I was playing around with it this morning, trying to do stuff that I shouldn't have done. And uh, Type under pressure. Okay, sorry. What it was doing, I had created a variable that it didn't want to load because it, it was done this morning and it's, it's still having issues. Fortunately, I have a PowerPoint version of this, so I'm going to switch to that. Um, I'll come back to that. It's just this one program that's not working properly. Um, so I guess I don't. I'm sorry. Um, I will fix this. This is, you know, I said at the very beginning, if I encounter a bug as I'm going through this, I will fix it before I even land in Pittsburgh. Um, I don't know why this is not happy right now. Um, I'll switch over to a different version. There we go. This one worked. Um, but there's, there's a number of these uh, kind of GUIs, uh, these graphical interfaces that lets you um, navigate through your data. So if you want to visualize what do my data actually look like. So if I had multiple subjects, it would have a big long list and I would select which file and it would show me the time course. Um, and now I understand what the problem is. Um, uh, but it'll show the probe here and if you click over here, it'll display here. Um, the problem So, 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 no, it still doesn't work. Oh, um, I'm going to stop embarrassing myself at this point. Um, anyway, so there, there's a number of these 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 uh, graphical interfaces uh, that that you can visualize the, the data, but most of the analysis is actually done uh, kind of from the command line. Okay, so we've loaded up the the raw data. Uh, we have this field data that actually describes the data. We have this field probe that describes the, the probe geometry. I'm going to show that right now. Uh, we have this field stimulus that defines the different events and their duration and amplitude and, and so on. If we look at the raw.probe, so it contains information about not only the, like the source detector positions, um, uh, but it also, because this is NERAX data and Thomas registered it up onto the head, it actually has all the information about 1020 as well. And so what I can do, and you kind of saw it a little bit, is I can actually draw that probe then in like a 1020 map, or you saw it as a 3D map. Now this is the problem that's causing with my data is this old, this, the data Thomas gave me, Nurex has changed something with their data format, and so my registrations are not interpreting it right, and hence 
my motor cortex is apparent way too too small and too far forward, and that's what's causing the issues right here. And I'm going to fix it. Just give me a plane ride home to Pittsburgh. Um, uh, but you have these, these, because the probe has been registered, we can actually view this in the 1020 maps like this. We can also view it uh, sitting on, on the brain. Um, and I'll, sh I'll show you more of that as, as we keep going. Um, okay. So, um, the first thing we want to do, if we look at um, this task, we know that, so this is just the stimulus timer. So this was 200 and some seconds long. There were these two events, channel one and channel 15, uh, which when Thomas collected the data was tapping your right hand and left hand, respectively, oh, or other way around. Okay, left hand, right hand, okay? And we know we did it for 10 seconds long, okay? So I said kind of earlier in my, my first talk that if we wanna do the parametric modeling, the kind of the canonical modeling. We need to actually know not only when the events occurred, but how long they were. So um, one of the first, depending on how you collect the data, uh, so, so in my systems, we have, say, E prime sending a signal on for the whole duration, the whole 10 seconds, and then off, and I just, I, I know from that what the duration is. In this case, we only have a mark at the beginning, so we have to go in and enter that information uh, sort of manually. Um, it depends on how your data was set up. So what we can do is we can, I wrote this utility last night or on the plane yesterday. Um, if it works. What it is, is it's the, um, that, um, whatever that screen, screen capture software. It's completely slowing down my computer. It, it's 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 okay, um, but I, I wrote this. It's it's called Stim Utility, and so I loaded up this this data. You see that channel information of channel one at four events at twenty three seventy three hundred twenty two seconds. Uh, channel fifteen will be the other ones. So let's go and let's rename them real quick. So channel one, right click, rename. And that was left. And if we right click on here, we can set all the durations. We know they were 10 seconds long. Okay. We're going to do the same thing for channel 15. We're going to rename it to right. And we're again going to set all the durations to 10 seconds. Okay. Well, that's updating. Uh, so what's nice about the, and so now if I said raw.draw, it'll actually draw with that 10 second duration. So now when I develop my model of what parts of the brain looked like this timing, it knows about the duration. If I had, put, if I had uh, as I said earlier, like a self-paced experiment where the duration is different for each, each block, we can model that. Uh, there was also a field called amplitude. Amplitude is used, uh, if you're familiar with fMRI design, in parametric models where I can basically have each block amp uh, mod moderated by um, some other factor like reaction time or something like that. And what I can do then is then I have, when I set up my model, I can ask the hypothesis of which channels, which channels showed brain activity that changed related to reaction time. Right, so you have let's say some sub some set of channels that activate from the task, and some subset of those that were resp responding selectively to reaction time. Maybe these parts of my brain just react to the task, but only this part of my brain is actually changing when I become faster at the task. That's an fMRI, what's called a parametric design. Uh, my toolbox can handle that if you put in amplitude information. Uh, it can handle both linear and nonlinear versions of that, um, which is which is getting into. Uh, it gives you the ability to do exactly the same statistics that you do, and your people, my colleagues, are familiar with doing with fMRI, and they've demanded that they also should be able to do with NIRS. So anyway, so we have we have the data loaded uh, right now. Um, 
because, as I said, because this is uh, NERAX data, it has that uh, information about the, the probe design uh, and the registration. And so this command, uh, probe.default draw function, that controls the default draw function. It, it, it defines when I issue that draw command how it's going to interpret it. And so the default uh, is a two-dimensional probe. Uh, if I say question mark, it prints out all the different options. And so you see there's different options. There's 1020, 1020 zoom, where it's only going to zoom in the region that I have the probe, but still put it in 1020 space. We can also do 3D meshes, where we're going to, we're going to draw that brain and we're going to draw the probe overlaid. So we're going to change this, actually. We'll change it to 3D mesh, showing it from the superior direction. And so now if I say dot, dot, draw, it should actually draw a picture of the brain. Uh, there we go. Uh, and this is actually an object that we can rotate around and, and so on. Uh, again, I apologize because the probe is clearly misregistered a little bit, um, but I will fix that. Um, anyway, so there's that. We're going to change it back to this just so it runs a little faster. Um, also knowing the registration, what I can do, I have these uh, utility functions. This one's called depth map. And I'm sorry, I'll bring that up higher on the screen in a second as soon as it finishes. But depth map, what I did is I, I said uh, depth map, and I said I want to look at the precentral sulcus, and I want you to overlay where my probe was relative to that. And so it comes up with this map is based on the column 27. Uh, registered to the 1020 space. But this is depth from the surface of the scalp. So this tells me that all the regions in yellow are greater than 30 centimeters. You know, prefrontal cortex or sorry, precentral gyrus with more than 30 centimeters away from the back of your head. Like that. Um, but these regions, if I have my probe right here in these 1020 space, I'm kind of in that ballpark of 15 to 20 millimeters, uh, which is accessible by NEARS. Uh, you can also see, oh, I kind of misregistered because the probe is too far forward, but that's just a, I'm not interpreting the data files right. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, so you can look at the data. You can change your stimulus information. Um, you can add demographics and, and so on. Um, and that all gets walked through in the demo or those, those example scripts. When you're ready to actually run analysis, um, there's a series of what are called modules, which are the processing pipeline. And so what you do is you create a pipeline uh, by basically stacking these modules together. So this, this set of four lines, what it's going to do is it's going to calculate optical density. It's going to take my raw data, turn it to optical density. It's going to resample. That resample function had options. The default is 4 hertz. Uh, and then it's going to run the bare line profile. It's, I then, I, so I created that pipeline of these three uh, jobs, and then I ran that job on the raw data, saving the result as hemoglobin. So now when I go and, and it finished, and I say hemoglobin, or I spell it right, dot draw, and I want to show that same first channel, now instead of when I said raw dot draw, it was drawing the raw data, now when I say hemoglobin dot draw, it's actually drawing the hemoglobin data. So this happens to be the oxyhemoglobin for the first channel, and we see my stimulus events and, and so on, uh, like that. Okay. So so um, oh, don't erase it. Show this and then run it while I'm talking. Okay. So 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 there's a series of. Uh, modules for basic pre-processing, you know, conversion to optical density, Beer Lambert. Uh, there are, uh, although I said we don't really do it very much, all that PCA and motion correction is in there, although it's not my default pipeline because although it's useful to be in there so you can compare it, what does it look like if I processed this way, the old school way versus the new school way? Really bad terminology. But, but you can go and you can compare the di different approaches, and they are in the toolbox. My preference is kind of not to, to do that. 
Um, so, so what I'm running right now is I ran my module called GLM. Um, yeah. This data doesn't have near, uh, near distances. This is the, basically what we collected yesterday with Thomas, which is you know three centimeter source detector distances on the left and right motor cortex, no short distances. So, so the way that, um, and this is like ten publications being expressed in like two sentences. The way that it, it turns out that noise, physiology, motion. Etc. Is, is is bad for two reasons. One, noise is just bad. If you had less noise, you'd have better data and be able to see smaller effects, right? Two, noise, every time you do a statistical model, you make certain assumptions. So you run a general linear model, you're assuming the data is normally distributed, stationary, IID, etc. that it's uncorrelated. And the problem is our data is not. Our data has outliers because it has motion artifacts. It has slow drift because it has all that physiology, which means that the statistical model, like the base, the basic statistical model, is actually wrong because it assumes your data fits these assumptions, and those assumptions are violated. So the solution, there's two solutions. One, either filter your data and pre-process it to remove those those problems, or two change your statistical model and choose one that is less sensitive to those assumptions. That's a different set of assumptions. I tend to prefer the second. So what we've been doing, so, 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 so while it's still true that if I pre-process and I remove the motion artifact, I'd have less noise uh, and I'd maybe be happier, by choosing a statistical model that really didn't care about motion artifact and was able to handle sort of heavy tailed outliers and serial correlations and, and so on, I can actually not even have to do that pre-processing and still get a, a completely valid result. So does that mean um, other objectives yes. Yes. Okay. yes. So my, the GLM model, um, uh, let's see if I can bring this screen up a little bit to show. Okay, so so the, the cause I'm sorry, because I know the podium is blocking this. So this GLM uh, module has a number of different options. Some of the other ones, like the resample, had options too. I just didn't show up. But when you load, you create the job. It's a structure that contains a number of things that you can change. So one of the things you can change is what type of GLM model do you want to use. And the default here, as you point out, is the autoregressive iterative uh, recursively squared. It's I forget what that acronym is. Something. It's the Barker et al. 2013 or 14 method, and it's like that's the way that I strongly recommend to analyze your data. Uh, it was the 90% of the math in my talk that I didn't get this afternoon. The way that this algorithm works is, there's again, there's two problems with, with the nearest data. There's physiology, slow drifts, and you oversample it, which means that it's what's called serially correlated error. So it means that you might have a thousand, or in this case, 80, whatever, 100 uh, data points but you don't have that number of degrees of freedom. You have far less because your measurements were not independent, right? And that's what's called serial correlations. And so, so, so what the, the approach that we take to serial correlations is we fit the model once, take the residual, design a filter that's going to whiten that residual. Now that means it's no longer going to violate our assumptions. And we go back and we apply that filter to both sides of the equations, both to the design matrix and to the data itself. And then when we solve it again, now we've, we're no longer violating our assumptions and our stats are actually correct. Um, we're also doing what's called uh, weighted least squares, uh, which deals with the second problem in the nearest data, that we often have motion artifacts. This data I don't think had that many motion artifacts, but if you deal with kids, I guarantee your data does. And those artifacts, right, we saw the data's cruising along and then suddenly jumps up and then come in, back down, and maybe shifted, and, and so on. But that, those time points where it jumped up and come back down were so much higher noise than the rest of the base, the rest of the data, right? They're outliers. And so you can do uh, statistical methods, robust regression specifically, 
that deals with outliers. And so now that's a statistical model that is less sensitive to having outliers in the data. And so we do that, and especially if you auto-regressively filter, those artifacts just appear as like, there was one point in time you just have so much more noise um, for both shifts and spikes of types of artifacts. And so by dealing with these robust stats, now I, I still have the noise in the data. If I didn't have the noise in the data, my t-scores score, would be higher. But because I've chosen the right statistical model, my t-scores are correct. And I, if you plot out like false discovery rate and stuff, you have no uncontrolled type one error and so on. We spent a lot of time getting that right. If you don't do that, and again, I don't want to knock anyone who's currently doing years research, but you're doing say Homer code, which doesn't account for this kind of stuff. Homer can tell you, say, oh, show me the results at 0.05 stats. It's closer to, depending on how bad your data is, but it can be 60 to 80% false discovery. <laughs> Which means that you're reporting on results that probably weren't correct. Um, and it's, it's because you violated, because the statistical test you did was not valid for that kind of data. Um, it, so so, so that's, that's, that's what we work on. Um, yeah. So, so what you do, okay, so y equals x times beta, right? That's your, your linear regression. Solve the model once, take the residual. Take the residual and find, fit it to an autoregressive model. Let's, let's call that f. Then go back and say f times y equals f times x times beta and solve again for beta. And you keep iterating on that. No, 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 it's, 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 it's a, it's a uh, finding the optimal filter from the, re, from the residual and then applying that filter to both sides of the equation and then keep going. And it's the same thing with the, the weighted the squares. When you do the residual, you calculate the probability of being an outlier. So these motion artifacts get downweighted. Um, No, it's it, the residual is a time force still. It's it's um, yeah. It's I can I can work through the math a little bit more. Writing equations in the air that only I can see is is not a useful exercise. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, um, it's, it's unique to time series analysis, yeah. It's, it's, it, it, there's other ways to kind of do the black, it's, 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 when you do regression, your noise is estimated from the residual of everything that wasn't part of the model. When you do a block average, your noise gets estimated for each time point individually. And so it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. Um, um, it still does have these problems. It's, yeah. it's not, um, um, yeah, yeah. If you compressed it first and then, yeah, it's, yeah, that is true. Yeah, there are, there are other approaches to, to this. Uh, this is certainly not the only solution. Uh, there are, there are, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. It's, it's, and, and I always, I, I, I always kind of hesitate when it's like, oh, your data's bad and someone like, like gives up doing nears because they walked out of my lecture or whatever. And it's like, please don't. It's, what you did was probably not that bad, but moving ahead, let's do it right. Um, um, yeah, so, so, so I'll, I'll show in a second too. Uh, there's a field here called basis set, uh, where you can actually set what basis set you're, you're going to use. And I'll, I'll show this can be, my default was the canonical model, but we can also do the deconvolution in this as well. 
Um, there's trend regressors if you want to put in uh, polynomials or something to remove drift uh, and so on. But what came out of that is what I call it subject stats. And so, so, so I, I issued the job, you know, job.run of I fed in hemoglobin. So what came back out was a slightly different class uh, called channel stats. Channel stats, just like the data, knows how to draw itself. It has features uh, containing the description, any of the demographics, the same probe variable. But now instead of holding the data as a time course, it's actually holding the estimates of your regression model, the noise of your regression model, the T-score, the P-score, um, and the um, uh, uh, Benjahani Hochberg uh, FDR corrected uh, Q value, uh, which is the, the false discovery rate. So you can issue commands. Like I said, it knows how to draw itself, and and I can I can just say dot draw, and it knows what that means, um, because it's it carried through that probe. It should actually be the three dimensional, no, the two dimensional version, because uh, it it looked at that default draw function. I had set it to be two D. And so it knows how to draw. Right here it's showing the oxygen will go down on the right side, so you get left-sided activity. Um, left-sided activity, that's oxy in the right. Here's the oxy in the left. I'll just close these guys. Okay, so there's, there's my left and the right finger tapping. So it went to the right side, right? Um, um, this is the T-score by default. Uh, but what you can do is you can... We can change the dot the default, and let's change that to the 3D, 3D mesh superior. And now if I issue that draw command, and I'm going to give it some other options that I, I'm going to explicitly tell it I want to show t-stats, t I want to uh, auto-scale it, and I want to show q less than 0.05. So now it's only going to draw solid lines if it met that FDR corrected statistical threshold, which hopefully the data did because I didn't actually look at this. Mm -hmm. um, but we saw it there, and this is n equals 1 with four trials. I it wouldn't be surprised if it didn't survive stats yet. Um, where did my figures go? What did it draw? Oh, there we go. They're just slow. But... Now, you see, I, ch I changed the default draw function, so now it's drawing it in that 3D mode, okay? Um, and, and actually, you see that the only things that survive when I tap my right hand at a Q of 05 is the left side, and the only thing that survived was when I tap my left hand was the right side with maybe one channel over there. So all of that kind of background survived my uh, statistical testing. Yes, it's tr correcting for, um, it's, it's actually correcting for anything within the variable. So right now, the, the variable, this, um, this channel stats, uh, that variables, it contains both oxy and deoxy for all 30-some channels of data at both conditions left and right. So I'm actually correcting for that whole 80 degrees of freedom, uh, you know, 80 different tests that are being performed there. With the, with the uh, Benjani Hochberg, I can also do if I if I wanted to t-test. So one of the other like draw a stats variable knows how to do a t-test. Um, yeah, I've been having this question about yesterday. Um, so if you have a variable that is oxygen-oxygen-related, I mean they are related. Yeah. Uh, here. Here. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so the that stats variable, that covariance matrix is full. It, it it's storing channel by channel, oxy deoxy, the whole covariance matrix. So, so yes, they are not independent. They are dependent measures. Um, when I'm drawing these images like this, um, um, I'm doing. I'm basically taking only the diagonal part of that covariance matrix because I'm either doing t test on this channel and this channel, which is why I have to FDR correct it. Uh, but when we go to uh, region of interest or image reconstruction, 
uh, I can actually make use of oxy and deoxy are not actually independent measures, and I have that information available to me. So we do account for the fact that these five channels, the noise might have been correlated when we do like a region of interest average, which I'm going to show you in a second. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's right now I'm storing all the information for oxy deoxy. I'm not really doing anything with it. The cross terms. Yeah, it's using, right now it's using the same basis set for both oxy and deoxy. Um, it's not using a lag version. As I said, if the task is longer than about 10 seconds, it doesn't really matter, even, even in that case. Um, but um, um, it, it, that is, those are open questions. Yeah, there is, yeah, and actually with, um, uh, I'll go back and show it. In that G GLM module, there was a field called basis. And uh, actually, I'll just show it right now. So, uh, job, job dot basis. Uh, it has dot. So, 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 it has a, a, ba a default um, basis set, and so this is the canonical model that it's going to use. I can change this and reassign it. If I said default colon oxy and default colon deoxy, I can actually have a different basis set for the two components of the model. I can also have a different basis set for left versus right. If for some reason I had a reason to believe the left timing was going to be different from the right timing and I actually knew it. You can put in derivatives. If you put in derivatives to your canonical model, it can model shifts in the data. Um, uh, so there are, there is a huge amount of flexibility to, to model this. Anything you can do in SPM, we can do here. Um, but it's um, not advanced topics uh, for this discussion, let's say. Um, but what, it, oh, I'm totally, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm wrapped. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'm not insulted. Um, I, I, I will try to wrap this, 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 this up. This is a good conversation, though. Um, but you can, okay, so, so as I said, there are methods um, that the objects know certain keywords like draw, and we saw how it draw, drew itself. I can also use keywords like t-test. And so I can say t-test, give me the t-test of left versus right, or right versus left, right? And then I decided to draw that. And so this is the image of the brain activity of oxyhemoglobin of the right condition minus the left condition. Uh, in this case, it doesn't really make sense. One is going to be red, one is going to be blue. It was, it was greater in left than right over here, and it was greater in right than left. So, but you get the idea, right? If I had done something like n back 2 versus n back 1, it might have been a little bit more meaningful because it's in the same area and you can look at that. But, but uh, you can actually do all the t-tests to compare different conditions and, and, and so on uh, within the code. Um, it can handle, um, I'll run this, maybe this might take a little bit of time with my computer being slow. Uh, but if I change that basis set, the default was the canonical, uh, I can use a deconvolution model. And now when I issue that same command uh, to run the GLM model, it's going to actually uh, do a deconvolution. And so now instead of a assumed shape, I'm going to actually have a whole time course. And I, uh, if it runs, I can take a look at that. Um, yeah, this, in the sake of time, you're just going to have to trust me that that, that works. Uh, I might pull up the image in a second. But it's, um, my computer is being really slow because I'm running the screen capture uh, software on it right now and it's driving me nuts and I'm very impatient. Um, um, but once you get that, then, as I said, um, if, if you had the human end response, the whole time course, it's a two-step process. You have that and then you have to define a window. So this command here 
Uh, I'm going to run a t-test. I'm going to use the block from uh, the 8th point to the 24th point. This is at 4 hertz, so this is actually 2 seconds to, to uh, 8 seconds. Um, let's say 2 seconds to 6 seconds. Um, and, and for the left and the right, and then it's going to draw that. And actually, if I do that, it's, it's going to look very similar to the activity map that I showed before with the canonical. If I had actually, instead of just taking straight out two to six seconds, I had done a tapered window uh, given kind of uh, a weight that's going up and peaking at, at six seconds, I would have gotten actually the exact same stats uh, as the other uh, model. And what you can do, subject stats dot table. If you say table is another keyword, it'll actually spit out all of this information about beta and degrees of freedom and so on. You can copy paste that into Excel or SPSS or, or whatever. Um, um, you can do, oops, I have to highlight the whole thing. Um, Again, all of this is in these demos, so I'm just I'm kind of quickly going through here. Um, but we can also um, define regions of interest. So in this case, um, this region of interest, th there's a number of different ways you can specify it, but you basically tell me the source and detectors, and you can use not a number or NAN as kind of wildcard. So, so this is sources one, two, three, and four, which was the left hemisphere to any detectors, and sources five, six, seven, and eight to any detectors. So basically this is the left side of the probe versus the right side of the probe. And so if I issue this command then ROI equals nearest dots, utilities dots, ROI average, given uh, my subject stats, and the ROI definitions, It'll actually now compute the left versus right, you know, left side of the head versus right side of the head region of interest for the left tapping versus right tapping condition. Again, it spits back all of these, um, the, the beta values, their errors, the Q-scores, the P-values, the Q, and it'll actually spit back a power estimate at the end too. Uh, because I, I can estimate the, I can estimate given your degrees of freedom and number of subjects and stuff, I can estimate what your beta was. Uh, so this is actually, you were really well powered, uh, except for that, that region of interest down there. Uh, and one of the things in NEARS that I'm starting to appreciate a lot more and working to my papers and stuff is when you talk about power analysis, when you do fMRI, for the most part, all of your channels have, your voxels have the same noise. In NEARS, that's not necessarily true. If you had a probe that was measuring, say, from the forehead or the side of the head and the occipital, the power in the occipital is going to be much, much less because you have more noise. Across the board, all your subjects are going to have much more noise back here. And so your power estimate down here, back here, is going to be much lower than your power estimate up here. And um, therefore, if I see activity and it was only in the forehead, I can't really rule out that there was an activity in the back of the head if I had recorded more subjects, right? So you have to consider that power analysis in there, and we've started to actually put that in um, uh, in here. Um, I will show then job equals news dot modules dot. It will run. If I had more subjects and more time to explain things, I, this is my last note, I swear, uh, it does do uh, group level analysis. So what would happen if I had multiple files, or multiple subjects, is it would have gone through, have run that GLM model on all the subjects. The stats variable would have had multiple entries, one for each subject, or once, one for each file. And then I can run this module called mixed effects um, that's going to do a mixed effects group analysis. One of the fields here is the formula, and um, you can specify this is the formula that's going to be used for the mixed effects model. And so this right here, the default is, I'm going to look at beta, I'm going to ignore the intercept, I'm going to look for group by condition treating subject as a random variable. And so this is what's called Wilkinson's notation. It's used uh, it, it's interpreted by SPSS, uh, although I don't think many people use it in SPSS. 
but it's, it's the way to specify these different formulas. And so we can specify complicated formulas with, with uh, quadratic terms and so on, random effects, fixed effects, et cetera, and then run our model. The reason we do it in the code here, so you could, as I said, copy paste, stick it in SPSS and run it uh, in, your, in your own way. However, SPSS knows nothing about the covariance between oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. It knows nothing about the spatial covariance that these two channels on my head had shared noise terms. And so doing it here, I'm actually doing it in a way that controls for that, and uh, which is something that SPSS can't do. SPSS, you can do weighted, but you can only deal with the diagonal component, not the off-diagonals, which is the oxy deoxy crosstalk type terms. And so doing it here, in principle at least, is, a, is more, is better. In practice, I've not really seen a difference, but in principle, it's better. Um, so, but we fully support within this um, uh, any sort of mixed effects uh, type models. It will do is another version that takes the same input that does ANOVA. There's a quicker fixed effects if you don't want to worry about the random effects terms that runs faster. Um, it will output um, diagnostic variables so you can plot like brain activity versus subject to look for outliers and then you can actually remove outliers uh, from your data that way. Um, you can put in covariates like anything that's in the demographics. So if I had multiple folders that denoted subject or visit or group or whatever, I can use those as keywords in this formula. If I input additional information like the NIRAX data itself, uh, when I loaded that data variable, when you save your NIRAX data, it went through and asked you what is the subject ID and, and what is their gender and age. Because it's all in the file, I already have all that information in. This one happened to, you know, uh, Thomas didn't enter any of that information, but if he did, it would all be available. And because age is a variable, I could put it in that model and I could look at, well, did brain activity change with age or gender or whatever. Uh, so we can deal with all of that same stuff that you would do in SPSS. We're just able to do it in, uh, in kind of a more near specific way. So I'm going to stop there. I'm 20 minutes over time already. Um, I warned you guys not to ask me questions about science because I don't shut up. Um, uh, any questions? Otherwise, um, I mean, we can continue talking. I think I'm going to be here for a little bit. And then um, uh, please send emails or comments. You know, I'm happy to answer questions. Look at the toolbox first in terms of it's demo folders, because uh, pretty much any time someone has asked me a, hey, that would be cool to show people, I've written a demo for it and shoved it in the toolbox. And they're all pretty descriptive. Like there's one called example of how to load NIRAX data. You know, it's, 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 I try to name them very descriptive things. Um, but otherwise, thank you. Thank you.